and we are going to broadcast inshallah okay and we are live so assalamu alaikum everybody so i see some folks are, are starting to join the call we'll give a few moments for people to join inshallah then go ahead and get started So great to see you. It's great to see you guys too. Alhamdulillah. Thanks everyone for joining. Oh, actually see uh, see someone joining that I haven't seen since college. I miss you for this. Hope you're doing well. Okay, and we are live on Facebook. So we'll go ahead and get started inshallah. And as people join us, you know, they can join via the Zoom link and they can also um, join us via Facebook Live on the Care Florida page. Um, so, uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salat salam, rasulullah. My name is Rania Al Gindi. I am the Programs and Outreach Director for uh, Care Florida. And welcome to another session of our Care Florida Connection Social Lunch Hour. So, our series weekly on Wednesdays at noon to make sure that as you're staying home and staying safe, you get a nice break in your day and you're actually taking some time for lunch and uh, what better you know, companion to food than some knowledge. So uh, join us every Wednesday, inshallah, at 12 um, Eastern time. And we also have Care Florida Connections on Sundays um, at 5 p.m. Eastern, where we have interactive sessions. We have a legal webinar coming up this Sunday and you can find all that information on our social media pages. So um, I am incredibly excited that this week's guest is my Shiro, um, a huge fan of Sister Dalia Mugahed of ISPU, the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. Um, and inshallah, we'll have uh, our executive director of Care Florida, Hassan Chibli, join, join soon. I shared with Sister Dalia, we're actually running into some issues of discrimination against Muslim inmates in prisons that may not be allowed to participate in fasting for Ramadan. So our team is quite busy dealing with that, but inshallah, he'll be joining us shortly. Um, and today's topic is all about, you know, social policy, civil rights, the responsible citizen, um, Muslim Americans during Corona, after Corona, I said that with an Arab accent, <laughs> during Corona, after Corona, what, what the role is that we play and, and how, you know, we can have some insight from this topic. Um, so Sister Delia, thank you so much um, for joining us, first of all. So it's a pleasure and an honor for us to host you. Um, thank and you I for having me. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And um, I want to just actually open it up with any opening remarks that you have um, about the role of Muslims in, in America during Corona and post Corona. I know that actually um, ISPU did a study recently about Muslims contributions um, to, to, you know, Corona relief. Um, so I don't know if you want to open, open, open us up with uh, some backgrounds, inshallah. Okay, thank you so much, Rania. And it's a, such a pleasure to be on with you. I'm such a big fan of Care Florida and all of the important work that you do. Um, we're also really lucky to work with Hassan specifically. Um, he's also, in addition to his many other roles, he's an ISPU educator. So he went through our training program to be able to um, conduct uh, presentations on our research. And he's doing a phenomenal job at that. Uh, as well as leading uh, the work of care in Florida. I just want to give you a brief background on the Muslim community and how the COVID-19 crisis is impacting our community, maybe in a unique way. Uh, of course, this crisis is, is impacting every single American and um, no, one, no one's life hasn't changed at all. Uh, for the Muslim community though, there are a number of ways that it's impacting us a little differently. So first, um, American Muslims are the most racially and um, ethnically diverse faith community in America. We have uh, no majority race and um, our community is, is broken down to basically almost equal portions, Arab, Asian, 
each about 18%, um, thir uh, a third to about a quarter uh, of our community are identify as black or African American and uh, about a quarter identify as white. We have 7% Latino Muslims and, um, and then the rest are, are every other, you know, every other group mixed as well as 1% are Native American. So very diverse. Um, we're also on average the youngest community. So just our average age is the youngest. Now, how is the COVID crisis impacting our community uh, somewhat uniquely? So there's at least three ways. One is that despite what you know might be out there in, in the imagination of many Muslims, um, lots and lots of Muslims are low income. So about a third of Muslims report incomes that are at or just barely above the poverty line. And it's the highest percentage of any faith community. So we have the largest percentage of people within our faith community that identify, you know, that report low income, that are low, that are poor, that um, are struggling economically. And so the COVID crisis impacts the poor disproportionately, worse than it does anyone else for, for a number of reasons, the kinds of jobs they're gonna have um, are either ones where they're they're forced to go into work and and be on the front lines and and risk their health and so forth without um, necessarily having the right protection, or they lost their job. Their their jobs are ones that are not being um, are not you know continuing through through this crisis. They aren't people who are able to work you know on their laptop all day and be on Zoom as their as their job. So, so it's impacting low-income people in a very different way than it is maybe um, you know, people with other professions that are able to continue working throughout this crisis. That's one way. The second way is through every state that's released race, racial data, you know, the, the impact of the COVID crisis broken out by race, we've seen that African-Americans are disproportionately impacted by the COVID crisis. So like one example, is in Chicago, 70%, 70, 70% of people who have died of the uh, of coronavirus have been black. And it's in a city where they only make up 29% of the population. So over representation of those impacted by the COVID crisis. And about a third of our community is also black. So black Muslims are being impacted in a very unique way. And ISP is actually going to be um, doing a, a webinar specifically on this topic of how it impacts black Muslim communities on Tuesday. And I encourage you to tune in to this really important um, topic. We're doing it in partnership with uh, the Black Muslim COVID Coalition. The other way that it impacts our community is that um, sort of on the other side of the spectrum of, of uh, income, although it's in this case, it, it's interesting, but both groups are being impacted. So we have a lot of, we have a third that are low, uh, low um, a third of our community is low income. We also have a disproportionate number of doctors in our community, so health uh, healthcare workers. Um, so in Michigan, for example, where Muslims make up less than 3% of the population, 15% of the doctors are Muslim. So a huge overrepresentation of Muslims in the medical field. And these are the frontline, um, you know, some of the frontline workers who are being impacted because they're risking their lives every day. And they're also risking their mental health. So if you've talked to anyone who's been in hospital wards and ICUs in hospitals where they're caring for COVID patients, they've, they've all said like, I've never seen anything like this. And so just not only their physical health, but their mental health is, is being impacted. So those are some of the ways that this current crisis is impacting our community. Thank no, you. I just wanted to add, I'm sorry, you asked about contributions. So we, at ISPU, we've been um, collecting con uh, stories of contributions. How are Muslims responding? So despite this, this heavy impact on the community, it's been really inspiring just to see these stories streaming in of how people are responding with compassion to, to, the, you know, to society at large. Um, Muslims doing everything from sewing masks and, and um, 
collecting money for, for those who have been impacted economically to, to one brother who's working on an invention of like a, a, an affordable ventilator. So people have been um, responding in, in just beautiful ways. And we've been collecting these stories and are kind of releasing them as, as we go. And, and we'll be um, also compiling them into a report. Absolutely. No, that's great to hear. I think, you know, even myself, I have some family members um, who are medical professionals and uh, it really is to hear, you know, from the front lines, what's happening. It's, it's a different, um, it's a different narrative. You can't really wrap your head around it. And I think for some of us who, who don't have that experience, you know what I mean? It's, it's very important for us to know their narratives and what others are going through, especially being part of the Muslim um, American community. So we've also um, had, we have a staffer who's putting um, onto the chat, the, you know, ways that you can stay in contact with ISPU. We'll be sharing some links throughout the call, um, their email list, CARE's email list, and how you can get more information about the topics that we're discussing. Um, and so actually, Sister Dahlia, you, you, you touched on an important point that I wanted to kind of dig into a little bit, which is about um, common misconceptions about the American Muslim community. Mm -hmm. And we know that, um, unfortunately, not, not only do we have misconceptions that, you know, non-Muslims have about the American Muslim community, but we have a lot of misconceptions as Muslims uh, that, that we have. And yeah. so um, even though we can't, I want to encourage everybody, even though we can't hear or see you, we want to hear from you. So please go ahead and use the chat feature and use um, the Q&A to access your questions while we have Sister Dahlia with us. Um, so the social policy nerd in me actually has uh, has a poll set up uh, on Zoom. So I think it'd be interesting. Um, you gave away some of the answers, but um, we're going to start a poll for the folks who are joining on the Zoom call. And it has just three basic questions about have you ever um, well, let me launch it. It says, uh, have you ever experienced discrimination on the basis of your religious or racial identity? Um, what do you think is the largest segment of American Muslims? And so if you were paying attention to Sister Dahlia a few minutes ago, <laughs> you should know that answer. Um, and then which group is the fastest growing segment of the American Muslims? And number four, where do you primarily get your information about the Muslim American community? So what is your primary information source? So everyone on, um, on the Zoom call, please go ahead and, and take that poll uh, for short answers so we can know, uh, do a little bit of a, of a survey ourselves on the call. And, uh, and while, while we're talking about that, um, what are some of the other, while we're waiting for folks to kind of take the call, we have some responses coming in. Uh, what are some of the other big misconceptions that folks have on the American Muslim community? It could be regarding our age. Um, you mentioned our diversity. It could be also about our civic um, participation as a group. Yeah. Well, I think more and more people have a more, I you know, as I, as I travel around the country, I think the um, the misperceptions are definitely waning. So I feel good about that. But you know, for a long time, there was definitely um, a misperception about Muslims all being rich. You know, this idea that Muslims are rich, Muslims have money. Yeah, a lot of Muslims do have money, and a lot of Muslims are rich, and we're, you know, that's great. For, but but that's not everyone. And and I think we forget that. Um, there are a lot of poor Muslims. There are a lot of Muslims who are struggling economically. And, um, and it's not an insignificant percentage. It's actually the biggest percentage of any faith group. So a full third of us are struggling. And we can't forget um, this segment of our community. And, and we have to think a lot about how are we including them um, you know, and I say we, I mean, those who, who aren't in that segment, how, how are the rest of us, including uh, Muslims who are struggling socioeconomically, are we, are we making our gatherings accessible to them? Are, um, are they even within our minds, like, are they invisible to us or are we thinking about them? I know Hassan just joined. Hey, good to, good to see you. Yeah. Um, the other misconception or another misconception I think a lot of people have uh, is, is how our, you know, our ethnic makeup, right? Um, if you go to a mosque that's predominantly South Asian, the, con you know, the idea is often, well, the majority of Muslim Americans are South Asian, which is just not true. 
right? We have no majority race at all. And the, and the plurality, the largest segment uh, are African-Americans. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's just something to uh, always have in your mind that uh, we're a very diverse community and, and um, always think about how, how am I being representative in, in this panel I'm putting together or this or my board for my organization, or my mosque, or, um, if a quarter to a third are uh, of, of Muslim Americans are black, are our boards for our organ national organizations representing that? Uh, I know ISPU isn't and we, we need to do way better. So it's just these numbers are, are not just numbers for numbers sake, they're so that we can we can reflect the reality of our community in, in our leadership, in our representation. Yeah, no, I think that's so critical. So before um, I reveal the results of the poll, um, I wanna um, ask you about that and, and Brother Hassan. Um, so we have this, I don't know what, if we would call it implicit bias or association bias of if you're not going through it, I told you I was a, a social nerd, right? <laughs> if you're not yeah. going through it yourself, then you kind of think it's a non-issue. So this happens right. across the board. Like if Corona for me, for someone who's privileged to, um, to work from home, you know, if I'm not going through the same thing that folks in New York are going through, um, do I kind of underplay the whole pandemic? And then Hassan, you know, similarly, right religiously, right? Um, if, if folks um, ha haven't gone through discrimination, like maybe they've led a privileged or, or sheltered life and they haven't gone through harassment or discrimination, maybe we think that um, Islamophobia is actually not such a big deal in this country. So what are ways that yeah. we can kind of combat that as a community? To both. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you need to read our reports. That That's one thing. And I'm not kidding. I mean, I, I think people especially Muslims thinking that their own life experiences, everybody's life experiences is, is a real blind spot. I, I know how much I've learned just by doing the research that my life experience is not everybody's life experience at all. Um, and especially if you happen to be, uh, you know, white passing and no one knows you're Muslim and you think, well, there's no Islamophobia. What are you talking about? I've never experienced anything. Well, if your name is, you know, Joe Smith and you're white, yeah, it might be uh, pretty easy to go through life and not experience Islamophobia. But if you're visibly Muslim and you have a different kind of name, your life is a little different than that. And there's also a socioeconomic factor. Islamophobia is very gendered and it's very uh, class sensitive. This is what a lot of people don't get that um, people with uh, people who struggle socioeconomically ironically actually end up uh, also experiencing a lot more discrimination based on both religion and race. So people with professional high paying jobs actually tend to experience less Islamophobia uh, for various reasons. And then it's gendered. Um, women do experience it more than men. So all those things have to be taken into account and people have to be uh, made aware of, of how, of their blind spots. We all have them. Absolutely, I think that's a great point. And Hassan, I'm sure that you've heard, right, uh, folks coming up to you and, is Care Florida's work really important? You know, how much do we really need it? You know, this is where we're overplaying it. Um, so what kind of response can we have to that? Very, very good question. And Salaam Alaikum, Sudalia, we're really honored to have you. You're, you're a great inspiration for me personally. And, and you've just uh, done so much. I remember when I was, not to put an age on, but when I was in college, <laughs> Having your work, it was a great honor and, and really just had a tremendous impact, a, a positive impact for the American Muslim community. Um, so we're honored to have you join us today. And, and you. you brought up a, a very important point, which is Muslim women will, will face Islamophobia more than men. And I wonder if part of the reason is, you know, there's going to be a lot more identifiable Muslims that are female probably mm -hmm. than men. Uh, you know, for a lot of Muslim women that choose to wear the hijab. And I love your studies that show, you know, when I'm training law enforcement about the importance of the hijab, and I can point that, you know what, 99% of Muslim women wear the hijab out of devotion or modesty, maybe 1% mm -hmm. feel compelled, but that 1% is equivalent to 1% in Jewish and Christian traditions that feel compelled to dress a certain way. That yeah. really allows me to make powerful arguments and, and break down stereotypes and protect the rights of the Muslim community. So ISP's work on that is critical, but you know, I'm often very frustrated with the brothers and I emphasize this is we should not be allowing only our sisters to be the ambassadors 
of the faith, we need to, I think, uh, you know, stand in solidarity with them. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what your opinion is on, uh, and whether it's Sunnah or not, for example, to wear a kufi, I tell brothers, do it out of solidarity with the sisters. Be identified. If there's a bigot mm -hmm. and he wants to get arrested for anti-Muslim hate crime, let him get arrested harassing a man instead of a woman. You know, we need to be at the forefront uh, and very vigilant in that. So I think that's part of the reason. I think a lot of men are undercover in their faith, whereas uh, Muslim <laughs> women are, are very at the, uh, much at the forefront. So we commend them for that, but we shouldn't be slacking as, as men as well. Um, secondly, I think when you, when you read in the whole Quran, you do find that a lot of times the people that make excuses are those that have been privileged and blessed. You know, mutra, mm. mutra fiha, those that have wealth, their wealth gives them a false sense of security. And we know that when it comes to Islamophobia, I mean, the, the great uh, point being the FBI visits, I know a lot of very well to do successful Muslim businessmen that have, uh, and women that have been approached by the FBI. We know a lot of them that have been harassed when they travel. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, Islamophobia as a whole definitely affects all of us, but we shouldn't be such a selfish people that only care when we are personally affected. That's not what Islam is. Islam is not a religion for selfish people, right? It's a, it's a faith of standing up for the disenfranchised, the oppressed, the targeted. And I think we need to change our thinking. This notion that something is only important if I've personally experienced it I th is very wrong. And your data plays a critical role uh, in being able to show how widespread of a problem Islamophobia is. And I, you know, I, I really commend those that support ISB. We need more. For us in care, that's like our ammunition right there. That's our foundation is being able to lean back on, on the kind of scientific data that you provide. So thank you for that. And I think for those that, that are not as involved because they haven't faced it personally. Uh, one is their time is yet to come because I'm sure there will be a time when they, when, when they do face it, they are somebody that they know. But two, Islam is not a faith of selfishness. It is a faith of standing up for uh, the, the weakest uh, amongst us. And, uh, and the data is definitely there to show that a lot of us do face it at different levels and we need to invest proactively. Look, the prophets of Allah, I mean, there was a time when they came to Rasulullah and said, listen, you do your thing, we'll do, uh, you know, we'll worship your way one way in one year and you worship our way. He said, no. You know, I'm here to create a positive change in society. I'm here to stand up for the oppressed, the disenfranchised. And that's why they opposed him. I mean, he was challenging the social economic structure of his time. It wasn't just, I think, a religious thing. He, they were afraid uh, of losing their wealth. They were afraid of losing their power. Uh, Muslims shouldn't be afraid to rock the votes. The messengers of Allah came to rock the vote for the better. No, that's a very well said. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Brother Hassan. Islam is not for the selfish. Um, we're going to speak about rocking the vote a little, oh, rocking the boat and rocking the vote a little later in the call, inshallah. Um, and uh, and I also appreciate. I shared with the viewers that you know you were you were a little late joining the call. We were dealing with a lot of prisoner rights issues actually, and about institutions who are trying to cancel Ramadan, you know, and prevent Muslim inmates from being able to practice Ramadan. And I I love a quote from our uh, North Florida coordinator Hiba Rahim, who said on a on a a Muslim inmate advocacy call, you know, when the brothers tell her, you know, Hiba, is it appropriate for you to go into prisons? She says, you know, brother, step up and I'll step back. So we do, we definitely need that, that effort um, across the community for us all to be involved, inshallah. So before we get to the next question, I want to actually go through the poll results and then also keep encouraging everybody to, you know, submit your questions in the Q&A box, inshallah. So um, number one was, have you experienced discrimination? So subhanAllah, 71% um, of the folks on the call said that yes, they have this, this experienced religious or racial um, discrimination. And 21% uh, said, I'm not sure, because, you know, sometimes we go through instances and we don't really know if that was explicit discrimination, right? But that's definitely something that, that we want to include when we're having that conversation. Um, who do you think the largest segment of American Muslims are? So overwhelmingly was um, African Americans. So we know that, you know, Sister Delia said there was a, a pretty even break, but that is one of the largest groups. So you helped them out with that one. Yeah, I'm um, glad they were listening. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Uh, number three was what group do you think is the fastest growing segment of American Muslims? And most people thought it was um, African Americans and in second came Hispanic Americans. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that Hispanic Americans are actually the mm -hmm. fastest growing um, segment within the, the American Muslim group. They're, they're the highest yeah. population rights, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then number four, which is what where I want to leave off, which was uh, where do you primarily get your information about the Muslim American community from? So alhamdulillah, 36% of our viewers are very educated, smart individuals who go to research institutions to get their information. Um, and then a few on WhatsApp, a few their local uh, leadership, no one from Fox News. Okay, that's good news. <laughs> 
Um, but the, sec the, the second and third choice were general news and media and social media. So I want to spend, um, you know, a few minutes perhaps talking about, you know, this is not, this is, uh, this is common, right? We get a lot of inf our information from the media because that's what we have the easiest access to. So what are some of the dangers of getting, relying on the media for our information, especially about um, Muslim Americans? How can we reclaim that narrative? And if we want to, you know, even speak to a little bit about the behind the scenes, what's funding the media and, and why that might be an issue we need to be aware of. Yeah, so first of all, Muslims are just as impacted by negative media against Muslims as anyone else. We're not immune to internalizing Islamophobia. And that's a really important point to keep in mind. Uh, so according to our research, Muslims were as likely, this, this is like one of the most shocking findings I've ever seen, but we were as likely as white evangelicals White evangelicals are the most Islamophobic religious group in America. I'm not saying that to be mean to them. I'm just talking about like facts, like empirical data. And Muslims were as likely as white evangelicals, not just the general public. They were higher than the general public, but and as likely as white evangelicals to, associate, to say that um, Muslim Americans were more prone to violence than other people. So Muslims are thinking this about themselves. And, and that, is the, that is a testimony to the power of media. And I say this because uh, when you look at, when we've done studies on media and portrayals of Muslims in media, we found something really, really um, disconcerting and shocking. But we found that when, um, when a Muslim uh, is, is accused of allegedly plotting a violent act, so not committing a violent act, but plotting a violent act, that plot that was, you know, thwarted gets 770% more media coverage than an almost identical thwarted plot carried out by non-Muslim, also for ideological reasons, say a white supremacist or an anti-government um, extremist. So oh. you have these, you have a, a, Muslims getting much more attention for, um, for these thwarted plots. And, and what's really important to note about these thwarted plots is the vast majority of them involve a sting operation. And what that means is uh, that um, a law, member of law enforcement was involved in incriminate or, you know, in, in the plot in some way, in the, in the majority of cases, it is the member, it is the undercover um, informant or, or FBI agent that supplied the weapon or the alleged weapon, the, you know, the, the false bomb or whatever to the person who then got, um, you know, uh, convicted for, for uh, allegedly uh, doing this plot. So, the vast majority of the Muslims in this case, in, in, uh, or, or people perceived to be Muslim um, in these plots involve a, a member of law enforcement supplying the weapon. And yet they're getting both more media coverage, far more media coverage and uh, a much, much higher sentence for an identical plot um, a, you know, that was also thwarted. But in the case of non-Muslims, they are creating their own weapon. They are not being supplied weapons by law enforcement. That, that almost never happens. It, it happened in, in just like one or two of the of 10 plots that we studied. So despite the fact that they're not even able to, to create their own, you know, they're not, they're not supplying their own weapons or being given weapons by, by law enforcement, they're getting far more attention and far more um, time, time in prison. And so when Muslims are consuming this kind of day, uh, this kind of media, just like everybody else, they're, they're getting this impression, just like everybody else, that Muslims are more likely to be violent than other people because that's what they're seeing all the time. And it's impacting Muslims even more than other people because it, we pay attention to it more, right? If it's about Muslim, we're going to be tuned in and it's gonna be something we, we think about more, whereas it might just be something that 
isn't something that um, everyone is paying attention to equally. The other thing we found is that Muslims are the most likely faith community to say that when they hear about a member of their group doing something violent in the news, that they feel personally ashamed. So we, we ask Jews, Catholics, Protestants, and other faith groups and non-faith groups, if they feel personally ashamed when they hear about a member of their group doing something wrong. And Muslims were the highest, the most likely group to say they feel personally ashamed. Whereas we have as much to do, you know, which is nothing to do with these violent acts as anyone else's, um, you know, group. But yet we were sort of internalizing it as something that we, we feel responsible for or ashamed of. And so for all these reasons, it's extremely important to be very critical and very careful of the media you consume before non-Muslims, before the public, before anyone else. I'm concerned about how Muslims are consuming negative media about Islam and Muslims. Absolutely. And I know, Hassan, you're familiar with those um, entrapment cases mm -hmm. that uh, that Daria was referring to. Uh, Hassan actually had me read The Muslims Are Coming uh, as I was I was as I was joining the Care Florida team, which is a uh, highly recommend the book. Um, so you guys can learn about, you know, the policy of the intention behind a lot of, you know, these acts and these policies that have developed. But Hassan, I'll turn the floor over to you. No, I mean, very well said, Sister Dahlia. And the, the Muslims Are Coming is a, a book I highly recommend everyone to read. It's what, by NYU professor Arun Kanani, and he speaks about the link between Islamophobia, the war on terrorism, extremism, and, and national security and civil rights. And, you know, so highly remind me of some cases we dealt with in Florida. I mean, in Florida, you had a man who threatened to blow up some masajid. He actually had the weapons. He, you know, called the mission and said he was going to do it. And, and the FBI immediately arrested him and you know, uh, just slapped him on the wrist with some very petty charges, mm -hmm. maybe possible with less than a year in jail, versus you had some mentally, literally schizophrenic child, uh, uh, you know, underage who you know was taken advantage of by a paid FBI informant who we knew from the community, frankly. You know, uh, this is why we say don't speak with the FBI without a lawyer because this apparent guy who's an apparent community member uh, brainwashed this kid, and and what they do then when they brainwash. You know, you'll have a kid who's objecting, you know, oh, American foreign policy is horrible. Um, and I don't want us to stifle our credit. We need to be more vocal, but we also just need to be aware of these plots. And it's very easy to protect against them. Don't, you know, be aware of people that are promoting illegal activity within the community. I mean, they tend to be FBI uh, agent provocateurs. But in this case, uh, you know, you, in one case with the white guy, you, they, they, um, he had weapons. He threatened to blow up a mosque. They immediately arrested him and, and charged him something less than a year in jail. In the case of the mentally disturbed Muslim ch kid, uh, they, they went and they got him a bazooka, you know, and they led him on and they promoted it. And then if you have a bazooka or a rocket launcher, it's like a mandatory minimum 40 year sentence just mm -hmm. by possession of that weapon, which nobody can buy. I and mean, you can run the mafia here and you're not going to get your hands on a bazooka. So literally they give him something nobody has access to, but carries a minimum 40 year sentence. And, and they make the little huge and they make the, the huge big yeah. and I think they will be enforcing sort of the white, white supremacy issues. And in terms of the media, actually, I, I went through the ISPU presentation we were trained on just last week because I was dealing with uh, some CNN reporters and I was able to point, you know, uh, one of, some of the points you made uh, over there, how um, Islam is represented in the media worse than, uh, than, than cancer sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. Worse than North yeah, in the New York Times, actually, yeah. over the past 25 years, worse exactly. than cancer and cocaine. Yeah. So that that's that's crazy. And then I showed the link. So you have, you know, the media misrepresenting the Muslim community, which leads to a tolerance amongst the public for undermining Muslim civil rights, which mm -hmm. undermines everybody's civil rights, and which creates monsters like you have with the Trump administration that now is beating up on the media. So it's a cycle. <laughs> and I don't think they realize how they're complicit. The truth of the matter be told. I don't think friendly media is, com is aware of how complicit they are in fueling Islamophobia unintentionally. And, and one of the conversations I had with one of the one of the CNN reporters was, you know, why did you choose to call Daesh Islamic State? Why did you choose to translate its name into English? You didn't do so for Hezbollah, Hamas, and other groups that have a similar designation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, you, you don't call it the Party of God, right? Exactly. Uh, or, or the best example I like to use is Al Qaeda, you know, because that was the most notorious terrorist the organization. Base. The yeah, base. Yeah, it sounds so it, meaningless. The meaningless. Base, yeah. Back to the base kills versus Islamic State kills, Islamic State rapes. Well, that has a negative impact on Muslims as a whole. It can mm -hmm. tremendously 
the feudal Islamophobia. Why the double standard? There's a double standard there. And that double standard has been used to undermine the freedom of the Muslim community. But I do believe at the end of the day, we as the Muslim community, we have responsibility to one, invest in studies and data like ISPU, to invest in media engagement. I mean, when I travel across the state and I ask local Muslim communities, how many people do you have working full time to influence your local media uh, channels uh, or to engage with them? The answer is most often none. You know, yeah. so that was and that was my goal at Care Florida. I said, you know, for, at least for every city, we need one person committed to engaging with the media because we have to represent ourselves for ourselves. Uh, otherwise, we can't do that when we're misrepresented. And there's a lot of work to be done in that field. Absolutely. I can't stress enough that, you know, it, it really is the responsibility of Muslims to um, take responsibility of, of the narrative of Muslims, right? Like no one, one of the reasons that I respect the work of ISPU so much is that no one should be speaking um, on behalf of Muslims aside from Muslims, right? So come to us for information about us. Um, and just, you know, pointing out to everyone, check out the chat. We're including the links for how to get um, information, how to access these reports about Islamophobia and the Muslim American community. So check out the, the, the chat box for that. Um, the, we have great questions coming in, so keep them coming, inshallah. I actually want to, to take a, an audience question before we shift to, uh, I want us to shift from, we have the knowledge, and then, you know, now what is the action to follow? Um, and how, how can we use that action to kind of work towards something that's a hopeful situation. Um, but first, I wanted to take this question. I think it's very impo uh, important. So Tasneem Aluli is asking that, um, you know, Muslims are victims. And like you said, Dalia, they sometimes internalize that. And sometimes that can even lead to an attitude of, you know, victim victimhood. And it can even have us affect our character by being constantly afraid to be Muslim or reducing our religion, which Hassan, I know you've spoken to a few different times. Um, so what are your thoughts on this? Um, is there data to support, you know, being more proudly Muslim as a way to dispel stereotype uh, stereotypes and reinforce our dignity? So what can we say about, you know, fighting against that narrative and, uh, you know, the importance of, you know, owning our, our identity as Muslims in America and that that's actually going to contribute to how we change the stereotypes around us. So I'll open it up to both of you again. Um, I'll start since we were been, we've been talking about the media and studies about media. Um, this is a study that we didn't conduct at ISPU, but I had just read an article about it that it was an analysis of how Muslims are portrayed in the media and how it's predominantly negative, okay, except for one topic. There's only one topic where Muslims are actually portrayed positively. And to my surprise, that one and only topic was Muslim religious devotion. So the one thing that we're seeing positively about is our faith, like, which you might be surprised by. You might think the fact that, um, you know, portraying us as religiously devout is actually seen negatively, but it's not. In America, it's not. Maybe in Europe, where religion is basically hated across the board. But in America, America is a very religious country. And Muslim we are perceived to be religiously devout. Whether we are or not is another story, but we are perceived to be, and that's actually perceived, that's actually seen with um, a, a degree of respect and admiration that we take our religion seriously. Uh, that is the perception of the public. And that's the one and only thing that we're, uh, where the media portrays us positively. So don't, don't be under the assumption that being less Muslim is like the PR, even if all you care about is PR, that's not even strategically the right choice. So well, that's huge. Uh, and that's, that's, that's powerful. I think it needs to be said. Mm -hmm. And I often think that the American uh, sort of American culture, and, and I know that's a very broad term because there's so many subcultures within it and, and, but just uh, American liberties, uh, American society, for many Muslims that, that, that choose not to practice purely as a result of Islamophobia, it, it's actually a hujjah against us before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because as you mentioned, America is a culture that values faith. Uh, the, the constitution protects freedom of religion. So mm -hmm. I often say, I know your rights talks, Allah is with us. And then the law is also with us. You know, I remember I was, <laughs> uh, you know, a, um, a young Muslim fan, a man, a fellow Syrian who's a hafiz of Quran. And he, he was visiting, I took him to Universal Studios and it was time to pray uh, Asr. And he said, no, I'll pray it when I get home. Allah made the deen easy. I said, bro, we're not going to get home to like Isha. You can't miss Asr. The deen, <laughs> watch me pray. What's going to happen? They'll think I'm part of the attraction at worst case, you know. And if somebody does 
and she will sue them we'll make some money off of it what 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 why are we holding our <laughs> it's a win-win yeah you're win -win. Well, well you're praying with a civil rights lawyer you you feel exactly you but he was too he was scared subhanallah and i think it's just from a lack of understanding uh, our, our legal system and even to an extent lack of understanding our faith um I, i'm in, i'm quite interested by what happened in new york city where they were spying on muslims and the first Muslims they spied on were the Muslims who changed their name from Muhammad to Mo. Uh, this is in the book, Enemies Within. Muslims who sort of went out of their way to hide their identity became high on the target list. Mm. So they're doing it to gain protection and honor. And it became a means of their humiliation and subject, uh, subjection to, to even more discrimination. So again, hiding our faith isn't the answer. I, you know, What I advocate for is proudly representing our faith like both of you are doing, mashallah, while serving society, like both of you are doing. That is the best way to, to fight Islamophobia. Allah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you both for that. And uh, and yeah, I, I'm going to plug in our, our Care a Pair um, campaign, which, you know, gets at what our mission is. So we advocate, protect, prevent, empower, activate, and represent the Muslim American community. And, uh, you know, that representation is a key part of fighting for understanding and justice, inshallah. So barakallah fikum for, for that reminder. Um, okay, so I want to spend, you know, the, the last portion of our call on the action, right? I'm all about the action, the operations, what can we do about it? One of the things about Corona is that, you know, the Corona pandemic is that it really highlights, you know, the importance of the leadership, right? The importance of local leadership, the importance of national leadership. So can you both speak to first, um, you know, how pandemics or emergency response situations like this um, highlight the, the critical need for, for civil rights and for the knowledge that uh, ISPU, um, you know, provides us with, and then we'll talk about a few action items that we can take afterwards, inshallah. Well, you know, this kind of a, a pandemic can open the door to uh, abuse, right? Abuse of, of civil liberties. And, um, and also because there's so much fear, what comes with that is, is prejudice and xenophobia and so forth. So it's always, it's, it's when people are afraid, it's when people are um, anxious and, and susceptible to being manipulated that you need good information more than ever. And when you look, when you look at this pandemic, how much false information is out there, how much you know, bad information can kill in so many different ways. So it's it's absolutely vital that we get good information out there and that we use it. You know, we equip those fighting on the on the front lines with this information so that they can advocate and defend and protect the rights of the vulnerable. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, we have to take uh, initiative and, and knowledge is key. And I think in, in these times, as Sister Dalia mentioned, one, um, from the government side, I mean, they will use pandemics and, and crisis often to gain authority. You heard mm -hmm. President you know, go on, oh, the president's authority is absolutely um, uh, final. Or if you remember, Amy, he had like a breakdown upon it. But two, I think when people are facing a poverty, when, when their jobs are not secure, they may try to blame the minorities, the other. And I, and I do fear, uh, you know, that it may lead to increase in hate crimes. And, uh, you know, I'd be quite interested in ISPU's data on that. I wouldn't be surprised. I don't want to speak for you, but if there's any support for that, I, I would assume in difficult times and in election year times, and now we're going to have both of those combined, we may uh, be seeing more of that. But I also think the, the, uh, it's, there's an opportunity for us, because we're forced to have our schedules changed, uh, that we ought to use those changes uh, to, to grow ourselves, and to, to grow our knowledge, to grow our faith, to grow our confidence. And I know there's been memes going around where saying, hey, listen, if you do nothing, it's still okay because we're all doing like a catastrophe. And maybe there's some truth to that. Some days <laughs> you just shut down and collect yourself. But ultimately, you know, life is short. We got to make the most of every opportunity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I, I really believe he's not a taker, but a giver. So every loss is an opportunity for something else. And even opportunities hidden within these days for us to grow uh, as people. Alhamdulillah, I think that think that was permission for you, you giving me permission to do nothing, right? Uh, <laughs> That's no. how I think it. <laughs> 
Alhamdulillah. Um, no, thank you both. And, and, and Sister Dela, just to, just to stress, you know, the point that you said that, you know, we have to think of our other brothers and sisters who are, who are facing, you know, circumstances much worse than we are, right? We have to keep them in mind um, and, and the essential workers and everyone who's living a different reality right now. Um, okay, so what actions can we take as a Muslim American community? So one of the biggest things having worked in, in civic engagement is apathy um, from the Muslim Americans, right? Is like, we don't need to participate in elections because it doesn't make a difference anyway. My vote doesn't count. Um, you know, look at what, look at where we're at. What's the point of being involved? So how can we, you know, energize Muslim Americans that, hey, this is a wake up call. You need to take it. And if there's any time to be involved, it's right now. So what, what message do you two have for the community, inshallah? So, there's a whole spiel, right? So first of all, I mean, a couple of things. If you live in a swing state, such as Florida or Virginia, where I live, you can, you absolutely can make a difference. I mean, you know, Bush won in 2000 by a couple of hundred votes, literally in Florida. That was how he became president. So to say that Muslims who number in the, at least in the hundreds of thousands in a state like Florida, don't make a difference to even who the president is, is just false. Now, if you live in a place like California or, um, or wherever that's just either gonna be blue or red, no matter what, yeah, you can argue your vote doesn't count for president. And I'm not gonna argue with you, but it does count for your representative or your, your city council member or your mayor, your, even your governor and the, all those positions are incredibly important and impact your life in ways you may not even realize. Everything from the school board on up, local government is, is what dictates your entire life and your vote absolutely counts. Those, those people, I mean, they win by, you know, votes in like the 50s and 60s. Uh, so to say that your vote doesn't count is just false, especially when Muslims make up a sizable percentage of a local precinct or a local or a county or whatever. So in all those ways, we have to educate ourselves and care about uh, what's going on because it's it's not even, even if, it, if, if you feel like nothing is impacting you personally, those who gets into those offices does impact other people that um, whose lives are going to be radically different based on who gets in there. Things as, as important as expanding school lunches. I mean, if you don't care because you your kids don't need free lunch and that means like it's, it's not a big thing to you, think about the fact that for some families, just that will, will make the difference between someone staying in school and someone dropping out, someone having a future and not having a future. It, it impacts people's lives that deeply and that radically. So to say that you don't care or, or shouldn't get involved is, is really a very selfish position to take in some ways. Yeah, and, and to add to that, Jacques Lachimberville um, said, I think hopelessness really is from Shaitan. You know, Iblis, yes, you know, he, he, mm -hmm. he breeds off of hopelessness. When bec people become hopeless in God's mercy, they fail to grow their faith. When people become hopeless in their ability to create change, they fail to try. And therefore, the bigots, the haters, they win. Um, you know, so I think we need to be steadfast and firm and, and not take the satanic approach. You know, the whole conspiracy theory mentality, oh, everything is, that's just an excuse to be lazy. You know, that's just an excuse not to struggle for the sake of Allah, with your wealth, with your energy to make society better. You know, if people if people achieve when they say a human only gets what they work for. So if the forces of oppression and greed and injustice, and I think just greed, you know, if maybe it's not even driven by evil, just is driven by greed. But if those forces are working hard, they're gonna get their results. And likewise, if we work hard with the barakah we have, inshallah, we'll get even better results. Um, even if we are outnumbered financially or, or with resources. That's the sunnah that our Prophet Sallallahu left us with, you know, uh, especially as he taught us that if you have a sapling, you have a seed, plant it. Because, you, you know, if the day, even if the day of judgment is about to start, because you're not responsible for the fruits. Allah is responsible for the fruits. Uh, you are responsible for the effort, you know, and that's what Allah is looking for, the effort. And we are rewarded according to the effort and the intention, not necessarily the results. We may get extra barakah and extra blessings reward for the results, inshallah. But at the end of the day, there'll be messengers who meet Allah with no followers. There'll be messengers who meet Allah or prophets who meet Allah with one or two followers, you know. 
it's, again, it's not about the results. It's about striving, seeking his pleasure uh, by trying to serve his creation sincerely. And what a great, I mean, the greatest act of sadaqah is feeding the, the hungry, uh, you know, and it doesn't matter what their religion is. They're all the creation of Allah. Once one of the prophets of Allah wanted to invite somebody to eat and, and then he realized he was a polytheist and didn't want to eat with them anymore. And Allah, you know, uh, admonished him saying, listen, I've been, he's been, he's been worshiping partners other than me, you know, for his whole life. And I fed him now one day, you know, now you're not going to feed him. Like, no, we have to be in the service of the yeah. creation. Of Allah. We need to be that force of mercy and change that society needs for the pleasure of Allah. And inshallah, we'll find success in that. Inshallah. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, the, the point where our responsibility is the action and the effort and not the result. I think that's critical. Um, I'm really enjoying all the engagement on the chat and the Q&A, so please keep it coming. Um, actually, our staffer, Lara Abu Ghanem, she's reminding us that, you know, not just voting, but actually engaging with your elected officials because they make decisions that impact your life every single day, like Sister Delia said. Um, you know, it could have an impact on us, on the Muslim community, but also the broader community. Remember that we care about, you know, non-Muslims as well. Uh, you know, we don't have to give folks that reminder. Um, but so it's very important to have them, you know, engage with you so that they can hear your voice. Um, just, just to point out, you know, uh, elections in Florida have been won by 0.4, you know, 0.4% of the vote, of one vote, you know what I mean? So you're talking about um, in Florida, in central Florida alone, you have over 150,000 Muslim voters. Um, throughout the whole state, that number is easily over 300,000. So if you have an election that's you know being decided for the presidency or for the governorship or these big elections um, being decided by five, 10,000 votes, then absolutely we, we can make that difference. Um, you know, in the- I wanna pause you on that to reflect yeah. that. Sorry to interrupt you uh, before you just, I don't know if you're gonna move on to something else. In Florida, the Muslim bloc can swing it one way or another, 100%. You know, again, look at the math. There's about three to 400,000 of us. Elections for governor, for Senate, um, and, and for president are won by 10, 20, maybe 40,000 max. That's the difference, mm -hmm. which is 0.5%. That's one-tenth of our ability to vote. So we can definitely have an impact. And um, I, I think we need to realize that potential. Sorry, Rania. I didn't no, know. absolutely. Thank you. And uh, and then and the issues, right? So like we said, um, during this this pandemic, during emergency response, we have in Florida um, the the ruling that they're trying to pass to suspend due process, right? So basically to keep people detained indefinitely because it's a it's a state of emergency. So we have things like you know during times of emergency, what type of leadership do you want to have? That's very important. And do your elected officials know that you exist, and are they going to take your opinion? In, into consideration. Um, there's also, we have a government affairs um, coordinator, Norma Henning, she's working on, you know, all, all of these issues. Um, and she was telling me about, you know, textbooks in Florida schools. They're actually trying to change textbooks to A, um, assert that Muslims were responsible for slavery. Um, and they're also trying to pass laws that will mandate being taught about Christianity and Judaism, but not Islam. So, you know, these are very critical things. Who's on your school board matters, who's in, in your local council matters. Um, so just, just that reminder, that don't think that you know you're not impacted by it because you most certainly are and uh on that note uh so what we've what we've taken away from this call is that data is important <laughs> we need to equip ourselves with the knowledge so that we can you know guide our actions um and so with that i wanted to actually close on any remarks about the u.s census so we know that the u.s census um has been you know sent out folks have a period of time to respond to it uh, and again, this is something where if there's not understanding, if there's not that knowledge piece, folks are scared of it. They don't know what it's going to be used for. They don't know if they should fill it out. So just a message from you two on the importance of the census and uh, how we can encourage the Muslim community to, to fill it out and to participate. Uh, go ahead. I mean, I guess it's important to understand what the census is used for. One of the things it's used for is to, um, is to assign num the number of representatives to each state and to draw, um, usually gerrymandering, but to, to draw district lines. So if, if your district is undercounted, you're going to get less representation and less resources. So it is absolutely in everyone's interest to be counted in the census for all those reasons. Absolutely. And I would add to that, that I, I certainly hope everybody watching this, uh, go ahead to send, you could Google, how do I fill out the census? It'll be like the first thing that pops up, fill out the census. And, but just 
don't do it just yourself. I mean, be an amplifier, be an advocate, uh, you know, and, and go out of your way to invite your friends and encourage them to. I know there's a lot of confusion or questions within the community. I've had Muslim scholars ask me, hey, is this going to be used to like round this up or something? And they got other things to do that. Don't worry, but go ahead. <laughs> Uh, they don't need the census for that in any way, shape, or form. Your, your cell phone is sufficient, right? It tracks you where you are 24-7. If uh, you use a cell phone, they, that's way better information about where you are, who you are, everything you like. They know more about you than you know about yourself. The census is so the bottom of innocuous a compared yeah, to your cell phone. So, so go ahead. And it's crazy because like with the spread of COVID, one of the ways they talked about tracking how it spread is just seeing all the cell phones that came to Florida and where they left. So again, that technology is, is there. They got much better things to do to achieve nefarious goals. I would encourage you all, please fill out the census and just encourage your friends to do so as well. Encourage your family. Let's make sure that, that we're counted. Absolutely. Thank you both. Yeah, uh, we're going to save the 5G conversation controversy debate <laughs> for, for a different session, inshallah. Um, but no, absolutely. You, you're both right. You know, down to the, the state of your roads, right, and your, your stoplights, you know, these are all funding allocated by the census. So please do fill out your census. You can reach out to Care Florida. You can reach out um, for any support that you need. Um, so I'm actually just going to just end, you know, with a pitch to please check out the chat box. We've inserted the, the, inserted the ISPU link the care link. So uh, no excuses after this call, inshallah, you have the information at the tips of your fingers, spend some, some quarantine time, you know, reading and getting up to date. Um, please join Care Florida every Wednesday uh, at noon for the social lunch hours and every Sunday at 5 p.m. for interactive sessions. Um, and I actually want to um, uh, give the floor to both of you for any closing remarks, inshallah. Sister Dalia, uh, <laughs> let me just thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll begin. I just want to thank you again. Um, you're, you're a tremendous hero of all of us, and uh, we appreciate the work you're doing. I encourage everybody to go ahead and check out ISPU's research and support them too. I, I'm sure you, if you guys are like us, you definitely rely on the Ramadan fundraising, and we have a lot of <laughs> canceled. And I know some of our donors aren't going to be able to give like they can. But if everybody tries to do a little bit, inshallah, we can continue this work. It, it's critical. So uh, pay attention to ISPU's data. Share it with your friends and family. Uh, continue to be involved. And thank you for all the great work you do, Sister Dania. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hassan and Rania, for having me and for all the incredible work that you do for our community, um, especially in Florida, such a, an important state and, uh, and one with so many uh, so much work to do, mashallah. So <laughs> we're so glad that you're there uh, leading the way. Thank you, sister. That was a very diplomatic, very <laughs> diplomatic thing <laughs> with a lot of crazy things going on, but uh, we're working on it, inshallah. So barakallah fikum. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatullah, alhamdulillah. Thank you all for joining and we'll see you next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam.